financial crisis explained. An hour of insight and analysis on the turmoil affecting the pound. Coming up, no going back. The Prime Minister defends her mini budget and rules out a U-turn despite growing political and economic pressure. It was the right decision to take and we need to continue to make sure we deliver the economic growth, we deliver the jobs and opportunities. Concerns over an emergency interest rate hike haven't gone away. Lenders have withdrawn a further 321 mortgage products today. A £65 billion intervention by the Bank of England saved many pension funds and brought calm to the markets yesterday. But will that last? Well, over the next hour, our top business team are here. I'm joined by our city editor, Mark Kleinman, our business presenter, Ian King, and our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. Before all of that, we start with some breaking news. We've just heard from the Prime Minister, Liz Truss, on the pressure facing the pound. I think we have to look at what situation this country would be in if we hadn't acted. People were facing fuel bills, energy bills of up to £6,000. We had very high inflation expectations and an economic slowdown. And what we've done is we've taken decisive action. First of all, to make sure that nobody is paying more than a typical fuel bill of £2,500. That will come in this Saturday. But also to reduce our tax burden, to make sure we grow the economy and also curb inflation. And that's so important. It's a difficult time. You know, we're facing a global economic crisis brought about by Putin's war in Ukraine. And what was right is that Britain took decisive action to help people get through what is going to be a difficult winter. Is it credible to suggest that the mini budget on Friday didn't have an impact on what has happened over the last few days? Are you really suggesting that? Well, the biggest measure in the mini budget was the support we have given to people on their energy bills. And it was absolutely right that we gave that support. Because without that support, people would be facing high fuel bills this winter. I was worried about people struggling to heat their homes. But also, yeah, we, but also, business, also we would have seen businesses like pubs go out of business. So it, the, it was the right decision to take. And we need to continue to make sure we deliver the economic growth, we deliver the jobs and opportunities, and that is the long-term future that we have set out. OK, just on delivery then, um, we're being told already that government departments are looking for efficiencies, they're being told to look for efficiencies. Where on earth are those efficiencies going to come from? It's absolutely right that we always need to get value for taxpayers' money. You know, every pound that we take from somebody is a pound they could be spending on their you know, future on their, you know, what they need to support themselves. So it's right that we get value for money. And I'm always making sure that we deliver that. Where from? How are you going to do it? Well, there are always ways that we can organise things more efficiently. But what I want to make sure is taxpayer money is focused on frontline services, on getting our GP appointments, uh, making sure people can get to see a doctor, making sure we deliver on our road projects, all of those things that people rely on us for. But there are plenty of areas where the government can become more efficient. Can you give me an example? Well, not at, not at the moment. We're continually reviewing to make sure we're getting good value for money. And I think that's what taxpayers expect. Okay. Liz Truss there. Well, over the next hour, we'll be dissecting the government's economic plans and asking what went wrong on the markets. We have our city editor, Mark Kleinman, our business presenter, Ian King, and our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, here. Uh, but first, let's take a look back at a week or even just a few days that few could have predicted. It all started last Friday at 9.30 in the morning. We saw the Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, announce his mini-budget, revealing a major tax-cutting plan as part of his new Agenda for Growth. The pound slumped almost immediately and had plunged to its lowest level in 37 years by around 3 o'clock that afternoon. On Monday, the pound hit an all-time low against the dollar, down to $1.03. Late on Tuesday night, the lender of last resort, the International Monetary Fund, took the rare decision to urge the government to re-evaluate its tax cut plan, warning it would stoke rising inflation and increase inequality. 
And then yesterday, that major moment when we saw the Bank of England step in, launching a huge £65 billion intervention to stop a run on pensions funds. Well, let's start by bringing in our economics and data editor, Ed Conway. Ed, it has been quite a week, that's for sure. Uh, what's the current state of play uh, with the pound and on the markets? Sure, so, yeah, let's start by, I'll do a bit of an update, and I've got some charts that I can show you, just kind of the story of the past week, but also, you know, some of the bigger picture uh, events. Let, let's start by looking uh, at the pound. Uh, I'll bring that up because, I mean, you know, a lot of, at least the focus has been about sterling, uh, and particularly sterling against the dollar. Now, there's loads of things that go on when it comes to financial markets, so you can't just attribute this to one single thing. But let's just look at that picture. The higher this line is, the stronger the pound is against the dollar. Uh, and this is obviously last week, Thursday, Bank of England meeting around there. Uh, Friday, that was the moment of the mini budget. I mean, whatever you want to call it, mini budget, budget. Um, but look at what happened to the pound afterwards. Really a very big fall on an intraday basis, an unusually big fall uh, for the pound. And then over the weekend, we heard more from Kwasi Kwarteng saying that there were going to be more uh, unfunded tax cuts potentially. And look at what happened to this dark blue line uh, after that. When markets opened, look, it went down even further and then gradually started to recover over the course of the day on Monday. You know, this is, we're really just looking back at the last week or so. Then came statements from the Treasury uh, and for the Bank of England. The hope was that was going to calm markets. But look at what happened to the pound afterwards. Actually, went down a little bit until through into Wednesday when we had that Bank of England intervention. Now, here's the interesting thing. A lot of people wondering whether the bank still had the kind of firepower and credibility to move markets. Well, certainly that did happen. The currency was not obviously not the thing they were focusing on. They were focusing on government bond markets. But even so, look at what happened afterwards. Uh, the pound rallied a touch. And today, actually, it is relatively stable, certainly in comparison with previous days. It is, it is doing OK. And actually, those bond markets looking relatively stable in comparison with before. The other thing, uh, have I got time for one more chart? Am Go I allowed to do that? Quickly. Okay, right. <laughs> the, the other thing um, is looking at what's happening with interest rates. Because I think, you know, in a sense, this is part of the big story. Um, this is just showing you, so rather than just looking back at the last few days, this is showing you over recent history, so going all the way back to the 1960s, the level of interest rates. And I think what I want to do here in particular is just provide some context for whether the fact that we're very low at the moment is something we can be incredibly reassured by or not. Because a lot of people will have said, look, interest rates were incredibly high back in the 80s, back in the 70s, so isn't this actually, you know, a bit of fuss about nothing? Well, here's, what, uh, here's the thing. You need to adjust for the fact that around now, we tend to have higher debt levels than we did back then. Also, our incomes in comparison to those repayments are a bit lower. So when you adjust for all of that stuff, you get a slightly different picture. This line here, this red line here, is adjusted for that kind of affordability levels. And what you can probably make out is while in, actually I'll highlight one bit here so you can actually kind of see what's going on here. By the way, that's the expectation uh, for the coming uh, months. The expectation is that rates are going to get up to about 6% next year. So that line, kind of dotted line, goes a bit higher. But as I say, even so, that doesn't look terrifyingly high compared with what we see here until you focus on the fact that really it's the red line you need to be looking at to get a historical comparison. And that red line shows you that back in the 1980s, it is true, headline interest rates were about 14% or so. But actually, when you adjust for the fact that a lot of people had lower levels of debt by then, those mortgages, even with high interest rates, were more affordable, it's equivalent to about 3% in today's money. So that's the key thing. Although 1980s interest rates were certainly a lot higher in headline terms, in practice, when it comes to repaying them, uh, they were considerably lower. And if we focus just on this red line, which is kind of the one that matters at the moment, and look at where it's heading up to at the moment, how high is that in historical comparison? Draw that back, about 6.1, by the way. I just looked at markets. They're expecting 6.1 interest rates uh, or so next year. That's the highest level that we've seen since around there, the end of the 90s, uh, 80s, early 90s. And that, of course, precipitated an enormous housing bust. So really, that's the thing that's changed, you know, I think this past week or so. What's changed is that we... Previously, we're looking at interest rates going up to maybe kind of 4%, 4.75%, which is already pretty high. Now, those expectations, even though the pound has recovered, are still that we're going to have very high interest rates next year. And, you know, to, to a degree that we haven't really seen for a long time. OK, we're going to talk a lot about interest rates uh, in, in the next little section of the programme. But let's... For now, I think, just focus on what's happened over the last 48 hours, because I think people are still pretty much reeling. Uh, Mark, when, when we saw the way that the markets reacted, 
why do you, why do you think they reacted the way they did? Well, markets have uh, been uh, grappling with the economic outlook and uh, the path forward for unwinding many of the financial crisis era measures that were taken when the banking crisis was in a state of complete meltdown, you know, 13 or 14 years ago. We've had a period of historically low uh, interest rates since then. And so there's a sense uh, in the city that the levers that the Bank of England uh, has still got to pull are now very limited. There are a number of other major concerns as well. One of them is that under Liz Truss's administration, there is a very real sense that the Treasury and the Bank of England are working at cross purposes. And that is a major concern in financial markets and particularly for international investors in sovereign debt, in UK sovereign debt. So you've got that tension uh, there. So, so I just pause there because I had somebody on the radio this morning describe it as the, the government being in a car and, and having the foot on the accelerator and the Treasury having their foot on the brake. And it's, the bank it's of that England. tension. Yes, the, the Bank, bank of, of England, England with its foot on the brake. Uh, absolutely. It's a, it's a good metaphor for the situation that we're in at the moment, fiscal and monetary policy um, working almost in, in opposition. And you I'm can going to see... stop you again. What's the difference between, because a lot of people don't understand it, what's the difference between fiscal policy so, and monetary policy? So fiscal policy is, is, is around government measures to stimulate the economy and monetary policy is set by the Bank of England, uh, MPC, the, uh, covering interest rates, of course. And the uh, other big issue now is that we have a, uh, a crisis in... Uh, liquidity that we've seen affecting pension funds, which is why the Bank of England had to step in yesterday with this uh, £65 billion uh, and very rare intervention. Um, that may need to be extended, according to many of the people I'm talking to in financial markets, that, um, yes, as Ed pointed out, uh, there was some stability was restored yesterday, some order was restored, and that has to be a positive thing. But this is a, a programme that will uh, come to an end in a couple of weeks' time, and many of the pension funds uh, whose uh, you know, retirement savings are invested in and that affect millions of people around the country, they are concerned that some of the collateral calls, i.e. The, the demands that they have from their investment managers to post uh, money to meet uh, the changes that we've seen in gilt prices and so on, um, are not going to be sufficient when this Bank of England programme uh, runs out. OK, there's lots of words there that lots of people might still not understand. Ian, I'm um, going to get you to try and explain it for us. Just explain to us in really simple terms, if you can, exactly what happened yesterday. In, in term, I think people understand that, that there are pensions that a lot of people invest in, and it might be a company pension or it might be a personal pension, and, 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 and they're invested in different things that you don't really understand and know a great deal about. Uh, what was it that the bank actually did yesterday? Why, what was the wobble about pensions in particular? Right. Well, this was a very specific intervention made by the Bank of England, uh, what in the jargon is the long end of the gilt yield curve. Now, uh, These are the ones for a long period of yeah, time. Yeah, gilts are UK government bonds, IOUs, every... Uh, government issues them. It's the main way in which the government finances its day-to-day uh, -day spending other than raising taxation. You will, rate, you will borrow money and you'll raise, uh, raise it by selling gilts to investors. And typically they are long-term investors, um, financial institutions, pension funds and so forth. And this issue was specifically around the 20 to 30 year gilts. And why, why did it flare up there? Well, basically, if you're a pension fund, the natural buyers for these sort of assets are pension funds. Because if you're a pension fund manager, you want to know your, your liabilities are a long way out in the future, your payments to future retirees. So you want a guaranteed income stream that you can meet those uh, demands in years to come. So you would typically buy 20 to 30 year gilts because you know the money is going to come in because the government issues, when, when it issues gilts, it sells gilts. It, uh, so it's sort of safe and there are yeah, but there are regular coupons that come with it, which are pay basically interest payments from the government. So if you're a pension fund manager, that's a nice, safe investment, particularly with the UK government with its sort of AAA credit rating. So it's a very, very safe, non-risky investment. But what's been happening is that uh, these pension funds also take out uh, insurance in case they're suddenly caught out by inflation, by sudden moves in interest rates, and that's what's been going on. The, the counterparties on the other sides of those trades, because of these sharp falls, have said, well, we need you to put up more collateral, you pension funds, we need you to put up more, more money. So the uh, fund managers that sit in the middle of all this, the likes of Legal and General, have been turning around to the pension funds and saying, well, we need you to put up more cash in collateral. And the easiest way to do that, if you're a pension fund, is to sell your long gilts, because they're a big liquid market. The price accordingly... Uh, 
uh, fell pretty sharply, um, particularly on Monday morning. Uh, there, there were reports that uh, Legal and General, for example, were asking for billions of pounds from these pension funds over the weekends. That's why you saw the prices come off. And potentially that raises all sorts of concerns about the value of the assets that these funds are sitting on. And that's why the bank intervened in the way it did. And it's actually, it's a very, very specific intervention at the long end. These very specific things. And, and Ed, what would, happen if, what would have happened if the bank hadn't intervened? How catastrophic could it have been? Because it was a surprise that they intervened. And, and you were explaining yesterday what it was all about. And we were all sort of slightly scratching our heads going, well, yeah. why have they done I'm this? I'm still scratching my head about it. You know, <laughs> Ian's explained it better than uh, anyone I've heard there. Because, you know, this is a complex part of the, the market. I mean, the big picture is the bank does not intervene unless there is a serious risk of deep financial trouble. And that's, that doesn't necessarily just mean the pension system. It means the broader gilt market. You know, it's looking, working out whether there's going to be any kind of systemic risk. What they mean by systemic risk, a, a problem that seems relatively small to start off with, although this market we're talking about was, you know, a trillion and a half pounds worth, potentially, and then can cascade into a serious financial crisis that means all sorts of other parts of the market are facing trouble. So that's the first thing to bear in mind. They do not take these kind of decisions lightly. They do them very rarely indeed. The last time they did anything similar was maybe COVID uh, in the financial crisis as well. Um, and so if they hadn't have in intervened, first of all, there was the risk of potential mass defaults in many of these instruments. Uh, there was the risk of deeper problems, what they call, you know, as Ian was saying, kind of along the curve. So you have other parts of the financial system which rely on these bonds. And what, what we're talking about here is the plumbing for the UK economic system. Gilts, bonds, they're basically pretty boring and they're, they're boring most of the time and they're supposed to be boring because this is the boring part of the market where people are making long-term decisions with all of our money and they put, allocate them in certain places. And gilts play a crucial role there. It's a foundation stone for everything else. So when that foundation stone is shaking, and over the course of the last week it has been shaking because of the massive movements we've seen in those, in those securities, which are in part a consequence of people saying, oh, hang on, the UK is going to be borrowing a lot more money. You know, it's back to last Friday. The UK is going to be borrowing a lot more money. How do we adjust to that? And it's sending this kind of chain reaction through those markets where unexpected things are happening. And one of those unexpected things that happened is it turns out there's a big part of the pensions market where they're reliant on certain securities, uh, certain derivatives, and you get a bit of a kind of spiral. So the bank detected that. A lot of people kind of talking to people in the city, say, and then the bank listening to that, saying they would need to kind of step in and do something about it. As, as, as Mark and Ian were saying, the interesting and I think significant thing here and a cause for you know, reassurance is there was a period you know, during this week where people were, sh were a bit worried that even if the bank did do something that it wouldn't necessarily have the impact that they had hoped for. So the merest fact that we have seen, you saw it there, the pound coming back mm. quite a bit, gilts yields coming down quite a bit. That is quite reassuring. It shows they still have power but they've had to kind of get out a bazooka to reassure people. And the fact, you know, I'm sure we'll come to this, the political edge to this is they've had to do this largely in response. I mean, the government doesn't acknowledge this, but pretty much everyone else who you talk about talk to in markets will say this. They've had to do it in response to what the government has done last week. This has been the Bank of England at its best, though. As Ed said, there were a lot of doubts that the bank would be able to take any action here. You know, you had people like John Redwood telling Kay Burley earlier this week, it's not the bank's job to defend sterling. Well, the bank has made a big, meaningful intervention. As Ed said, it picked up very, very quickly on these uh, pressures that were building up in the markets. I think the Bank of England comes out of this episode looking pretty good, to be honest. And that's significant, given that the Monetary Policy Committee is under a lot of fire for being behind the curve on inflation and not raising interest rates rapidly enough. That, that is true, but the, uh, the question remains that if this uh, programme has to be extended after two weeks, does the, bank retain, does the bank retain that credibility? And that's an open question. Mm -hmm. and, and do you feel, Mark, you know, as Ed was saying, that um, when we look at what, what happened, what's happened in the market over the last 48 hours, that, that the bank's actions have now calmed things, that it does feel that everything is just kind of everyone's draw, drawing breath again? Yeah, I think that there's certainly been that temporary pause for breath that was the, obviously the object, uh, the object of the exercise. Um, but that's not to say that this is a... Uh, a line in the sand that uh, that means that stability will endure beyond the end of this this two week uh, intervention by the, by the Bank of England. I think a lot of the question marks still remain about the government's response 
uh, to this crisis, whether the government even acknowledges that there is a crisis in financial markets at the moment. I spoke to one former Treasury Minister uh, this morning who uh, insists that his intelligence from his contacts in, uh, within government is that there is no crisis, that the Treasury, uh, that the Chancellor is not uh, acknowledging uh, that there is a real crisis in financial markets at the moment. And uh, one of the things we've seen since uh, Liz Truss came to power and appointed Kwasi Kwarteng as her Chancellor is that the Treasury, which is the most important department uh, of, of state uh, in many respects, is, has been hollowed out in terms of its leadership. The first, one of the first actions that the Chancellor took was to sack the long-serving permanent secretary, the top civil servant. This is Tom the, Scholar. Tom Scholar, uh, you know, somebody who commands respect from across the political uh, spectrum. Uh, they, they, uh, and, and does that seem to be, have been a political decision? Uh, very much so. There's a, there's a, uh, a long-standing criticism from uh, from Mr Kwarteng and, and from Liz Truss about Treasury orthodoxy and about the way that the Treasury approaches uh, financial markets and economic uh, policy. And Tom Scholar paid, paid the price for that. The problem is nobody's been appointed in his place. Um, there is also uh, another uh, layer underneath uh, Mr Scholar uh, which is uh, vacant at the moment. The second Permanent Secretary, another very, very senior uh, job. And if you look at the ministerial lineup in the Treasury at the moment, there are five Treasury Ministers, only one of them has had any previous experience of working in the Treasury and, and that was only for a few short weeks during that period before uh, Boris Johnson stepped down. So um, there is a real, real, there appears to be a real vacuum of leadership in the Treasury at the moment and given what's going on in terms of government policy around uh, the, the vast energy bailout package that's been unveiled in the last couple of uh, weeks and uh, all of the other associated uh, economic challenges around the inflationary pressures that the economy is facing. Um, this is not really the right time for there to be a vacuum of leadership at the Treasury. Just to, okay. just to back that up, you know, I've, I've also had a few conversations and it is quite startling and stark the way that, you know, Number 10 genuinely does believe that what's happening now, the instability, is not a consequence of what they did on Friday. They say it just doesn't add up, it doesn't compute, and they do, they claim that it is you know, this is, this is other things, it's noises off. But that is, for, a lot, for most market participants that I've spoken to, that's kind of staggering, because you know, your first step in addressing some of the instability we're seeing at the moment is kind of acknowledging that there is something that needs to be done, whether it's more explaining about the plan uh, or whether it's a change of plan. And this is not really a partisan thing, you know? This is millions of people out there making decisions about what to do with their money and looking at the UK and saying, well, do we want to put it in there? I'm not sure about that. It's not partisan. It's not about left or right. It's about credibility and it's about faith in the system. And regaining that faith is very difficult, but part of the job is actually kind of saying, OK, we're going we're gonna to kind of collaborate and work out what to do next. OK. Uh, if you're just joining us, a reminder, you're watching a special Sky News programme, Financial Crisis Explained. We're talking to three of our top business experts and trying to help you understand, uh, helping me understand what's causing the volatility in the markets. We've got our city editor, Mark Kleinman, our business presenter, Ian King, and our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, here. Um, let's just go back to Monday uh, and a fairly ominous quote from the Bank of England governor, Andrew Bailey, in response to the pound plummeting. He said... The Monetary Policy Committee will not hesitate to change interest rates by as much as needed to return inflation to its 2% target, as much as needed. Um, Mark, how high do some people fear interest rates could go? Well, I think as Ed was showing on his earlier chart, there's a, a sort of baseline assumption now that they could go to 6% or, or more over the next year or two. Um, <sighs> Who knows? At the moment, who knows? We're in a period of, uh, of genuine economic uncertainty uh, with the uh, inflationary pressures that are affecting the economy and have been for many months since, indeed, the Bank of England started to raise uh, the base rate. Um, it, it really is unclear how high interest rates might go, and, of course, that has implications for our viewers and all of us in, in almost every area of our financial lives. Shall I, uh, shall I show you? Yeah, I just, uh, just to back that up. Get, um, show us some charts. And then I'll, I'll just be the chart monkey a bit, but I won't, yeah. I won't kind of necessarily go up here. Um, so you but, showed us the one before that showed how high it could yeah, go and the difference between... Exactly, that, 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 a bit of historical comparison, but just kind of to get a sense of exactly what Mark was saying, 
um, a bit of now expectations previously, where interest rates might head. I don't know, let's bring them up here if we can and then uh, perhaps I'll stay here and show you. Um, so this basically is where rates have been in the past. So you see the, the straight line, the, the, the non-dotted line, that is where interest rates have gone, OK? But the dotted line is kind of expectations for people in the market about where they thought they were going to go. And back in February, look, that dotted line was only going to peak at about 1.5%. OK, so the, all this is doing is giving you a sense of how the expectations have changed. This is looking into the future, OK? So this is your, not necessarily your mortgage rate, but you can imagine your mortgage rate is that plus a bit on top of it. Um, then, by August, look at what happened to that line. Now, this is people starting to realise, A, there's lots of inflation, B, there is a war in Ukraine, uh, and C, as well, we have a new government potentially coming in, and they have new plans uh, with the public finances, but we didn't know at that stage who was necessarily going to win, although the polling was pointing towards Liz Truss. Then, by the time Liz Truss was in office, look at what's happened to that line. It's going even higher. So uh, the expectation at that point was, no, it's not going to be 1.5% next year, it's not going to be 2 and a bit, it's going to be 4.75%. That was already looking pretty painful. But now look what's happened after the mini-budget, OK? So look at that line again, future interest rate expectations, and look at how it's gone up to as Mark was saying, up to these kind of levels of 6%. It says a little bit above 6% to, today. And that's the point, you know. This, no one knows for sure what's going to happen. All this is is kind of a measure of what people within money markets are kind of placing bets on for this future of interest rates. But that is what feeds into our mortgages right now because people have to make decisions, uh, investors and mortgage lenders have to make decisions based on what money markets are saying. What money markets are saying right now is interest rates are going to be a lot higher next year than anyone previously thought. And those kinds of shifts, I mean, you know, Ian might have a feeling about this. That's, that's pretty unusual, isn't it? Yeah, it's a very, very spectacular increase. You just don't see movements like that in the in expectations as dramatic as that, nor indeed in the way that gilt yields have been moving over the last uh, five days since the mini budget as well. I mean, these, as Ed was saying, gilts are supposed to be really dull, safe investments. You just don't see yields spiking like that. You really don't. I mean, it's, you're seeing gilts behaving like sort of tech stocks or something like that. And, and we're not expecting another interest rate rise. Uh until November, but do you think there's a possibility that, that one could come sooner than that? Well, the, the best guess that we have on that comes uh, from the comments that Hugh Pill, the chief economist at the Bank of England, made the day before yesterday, where he was very, very clear that he didn't uh, want the BNPC to be moving until the 3rd of November, which is when its next policy decision is due. Who knows? If you get more turmoil in, in markets of the kind that we've seen this week, and this is the thing that this is kind of the experience that we've seen in previous financial crises. We get days like this when things calm down, and then all of a sudden you'll get another lurch lower in the price of an asset, and away you go again. So it, it's, it's too soon, I think, to say that uh, the, we're out of the woods in terms of this stuff. And sterling is indeed drifting on the forex markets uh, right now again. So for, sterling is yet to forex, find the floor. Foreign exchange. Foreign exchange. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, so it, it, events may force the MPC's hand to move. I mean, they're very clear that they don't want to go before the 3rd of November. But if the markets force their hand, they may well have to. I mean, October is going to be a really, really choppy and uncertain month because we've got two things that we're expecting to happen not until November. One is the MPC meeting on the 3rd of November. The other is the medium-term strategy that Kwasi Kwarteng's promising us. That's not until the 23rd of November. And... Financial markets, like nature, are poor a vacuum. You know, they rely on information. They, they rely on, on mm. supposition and, and gossip and speculation. And if you don't get the authorities saying anything for five weeks, well, as I say, we could be in for a really choppy October. Uh, and, Mark, if rates do go up again before November, what impact will that have on the markets, do you think? Well, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's clear that there is a chance uh, that there will be an emergency rate hike. One gets the sense that... Andrew Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England, is doing everything he can to avoid uh, that possibility. It would be uh, truly disastrous if the Bank of England were to announce an emergency rate hike and, and not achieve the desired uh, if effect. I mean, clearly, uh, given what Ian was just saying about the delay until the next uh, set of fiscal projections and uh, how the government intends to pay for these uh, £45 billion pounds of tax cuts that were announced in the mini-budget last week. It doesn't feel right now 
that that delay until the, the back half of November is sustainable. It doesn't feel tenable uh, given the level of uncertainty, uh, the level of volatility in, in financial markets. I mean, before that statement uh, towards the end of November, uh, Kwasi Kwarteng is due to be presenting a package of deregulatory measures uh, relating to the city, something that's being nicknamed Big Bang 2.0. That's something that we saw uh, a taster of in his statement last week, the, uh, the abolition of the um, cap on bankers' bonuses, uh, the abolition of the top rate of income tax and the other associated uh, tax cuts uh, that he unveiled. Uh, initially to euphoria in the city, it has to be said, um, largely because many of the traders and, and uh, other senior city executives will be the beneficiaries of those, uh, of those tax cuts. But it feels now questionable as to whether that Big Bang 2.0 package can come before uh, this uh, scheduled statement towards the end of November because, um, as Ian says, m markets really dislike the idea of a vacuum um, unless the traders, uh, unless traders are benefiting uh, from the vol volatility associated with it. OK, well, well, we're thinking about what's happening in the traders' uh, personal pockets. Uh, but as we've been hearing, these are all uh, major impacts that can have on all of our personal finances. Uh, and our experts here are ready to take your questions at home. Coming up at half past one, we're going to have a special Q&A with this motley panel. Uh, scan the QR code on your screen right now and put your questions about the crisis to Ed, Mark and Ian. Uh, so have you got questions about the financial crisis, about is there something you don't understand or is it something that you want to know personally about how it could affect you? We'll try and answer it at 1.30, so get your questions in to us. You are watching a special Sky News programme, Financial Crisis Explained. Coming up in the second half of the programme, we're going to be looking at how to fix the crisis on the market and discuss potential solutions.
Welcome back to the special Sky News programme, Financial Crisis Explained, where we're talking to three of our top business experts about the pressure on the pound, our city editor, Mark Kleinman, our business presenter, Ian King, and our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, are still all here. Uh, we're going to try to discuss some solutions to the current crisis. Um, the biggest one that we've seen so far was, of course, the Bank of England's intervention yesterday to buy £65 billion worth of bonds to prevent a major crisis within Britain's pensions schemes. Well, is that intervention working? Ed Conway, let, let's bring you in. I mean, it does seem that the markets have calmed since then. This is, you know, this particular intervention seems to have done the trick in the short term. But, but what about the longer term? A lot of people are saying, scrap that mini budget from Friday. Would that actually make a difference now? I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. In as much as, you know, you can't absolutely put your finger on one particular thing, whether it's a policy or a move that was the explanation. You know, there's a load of different things and it, and, and it means that in the same way as it becomes very difficult to diagnose exactly how this happened, it becomes quite difficult to diagnose, you know, what are the buttons you could press. Um, clearly, acknowledging that there's an issue might be a star. I mean, before we even get to kind of, you know, policy prescriptions and, and what to do next, the fact that the government at the moment believes this is an entirely international financial market stability issue rather than something that's kind of domestic, that I think is unnerving people because it's like, well, let's start with the acceptance form of uh, part of grief before we kind of deal with the rest of it. But, you, I mean, it, it's hard to say. Some people think, you know, and I was talking to Charlie Bean, uh, former Bank of England deputy governor, and he, he thinks either, either you do a U-turn or um, you're kind of basically OK with the Bank of England raising rates to these kind of levels that are incredibly high and you just have to take that on the chin, although that's going to mean possibly a recession, certainly very, very tough times next year in the run-up. Or you have to unveil a set of spending cuts and fiscal discipline, fiscal discipline basically bringing all of that borrowing under control or providing kind of some detail on how you're going to bring it back. But the scale of those spending cuts would be enormous because the scale of the extra borrowing is enormous as well. And the difficulty here is we are trapped in a kind of a vicious cycle going down in the wrong direction. The government wanted us to have a kind of virtuous cycle, so generate extra growth from all of these supply side reforms. And there's a lot to be said about some of the reforms in, in the package. And that generates extra growth, the pie gets bigger, everyone gets richer, the scale of your debts are kind of lower because you know, they're measured compared with your ability to pay them. So it's like you know, all of us households around the country, we earn more, therefore our mortgage seems less expensive by, by the month. Instead, though, of being in that kind of virtuous circle where things are getting better, we're trapped in this other one where things are getting worse. And the problem is that that then means that all of the things that might just have been affordable on last Friday suddenly actually don't look affordable. You know, the debt interest bill, because of all these charts we've been showing you about interest rates going up, well, they're going up potentially for us as consumers, but they're going up for the government as well. That means you've got an extra 20 billion, maybe, of, of debt interest alone that you need to pay for. I mean, that's kind of a small government department on top of everything else. And that's leaving aside all of the extra measures that you've got. So the issue, Jane, I think, is that there is no easy button to press. And there is no easy button to press because we are trapped in what is effectively a kind of credibility crisis. A lot of people, market investors out there, non-partisan, partisan, as I'm saying, so you know, they're not just kind of doing this on an ideological basis, are really sceptical about this government's ability and its plan. And you need a pretty dramatic kind of acknowledgement, acceptance, change of plan, or indeed kind of detail on plan to get things through. And right now, the fact that we're not hearing much from the PM and indeed Chancellor is an issue on that front. And, and, and um, Ian, Ed was talking about the global economic issues, and, and that is something that the government have been saying. I, we heard them this morning arguing again that this is a global issue. The, you know, the bank in Japan had to step in to help the yen against the dollar. Is that comparable? Um, well, Japan is a very, very weird uh, economy, full stop. I mean, it's the most indebted uh, rich nation on earth. But the uh, benefit for Japan is that uh, most of its government debt is owned by Japanese people and Japanese institutions, whereas the UK, in the famous words of Mark Carney, the former Bank of England governor, we are dependent on the kindness of strangers. But there, it's fair to say that, I mean, inflation has taken hold everywhere. You've seen central banks raising interest rates left, right and centre. The Federal Reserve two weeks ago raised by three quarters of one percent for the third month running. Even the European Central Bank has uh, raised interest rates by three quarters of one percent in its last meeting. 
the Bank of Canada, Reserve Bank of Australia, Reserve Bank of New Zealand, all of them are hiking rates. And at the same time, we are seeing some extraordinary moves on currency markets. The, the pound is not the only currency that's hit an all-time low against the dollar recently. So is the Indian rupee, for example. The yen's at a 24-year low. The euro's at a 20-year low. So there's a lot of dollar strength in this. But there are unique uh, sterling weakness points to make as well. Because the IMF haven't issued warnings to those countries, have they? Well, the IMF's intervention is really interesting. I mean, it's very, very rare for the IMF to criticise a G7 economy. Really rare. I, I interviewed Mohamed al uh, yesterday, who's one of the foremost commentators on, the, on these sort of things, and he, he was making the point that he thought that the IMF were basically showing that they had to be even-handed, because quite often the IMF only beats up on emerging market economies, and uh, he thinks that they were trying to be, show a bit more even-handedness in uh, in saying that as well. Just to pick up on something that Ed said about cancelling the mini-budget, I don't think that's a, that's a non-starter for the very simple reason that if you think about what was in the mini-budget, the biggest single item, the biggest ticket item is the energy price guarantee. And for that reason alone, I think they have to uh, get that through on the, on the finance bill. Otherwise, households and businesses are not going to be insulated from these higher energy prices this winter. Um, and politically, uh, the idea of, of rowing back on... Uh, the, the Chancellor's and, and this administration's first major uh, fiscal intervention just doesn't seem uh, politically tenable. It, it seems like something much more dramatic would have to happen in financial markets to even uh, for, for Liz Truss and her cabinet to even contemplate uh, such an idea. It, it just does not seem like it's on the cards. We heard her speaking earlier today when she talked about the need to press ahead with these reforms. And as Ed was pointing out, there was a, a lot on the supply side that was welcomed last Friday in the mini-budget. The problem was, was that uh, one of the major problems with it was that it was completely uncosted. The Office for Budget Responsibility uh, was not asked to provide um, it, its own independent forecasts. And as a result of that, that fueled the uncertainty in financial markets about exactly how these tax, tax cuts were going to be uh, were going to be paid for. Uh, but But ditching all of those measures, or even any of them, any of the more significant ones that were announced last week, seems uh, untenable right now. One senior former Treasury official that I spoke to about an hour ago suggested that there's a possibility that they could be de some of the measures could be deferred for a year. But again, politically, you know, with a, a, an administration that has just a couple of years left before a general election, it, it just doesn't seem very likely. And the 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 sense in the city, the per very pervasive sense, is that the, the, the government is going to press on with this package of measures that was announced last week. OK, so it doesn't look like the mini-budget is going to be reversed. What then, Ed, other tools do we have? What economic tools are there uh, that the government has, that, that the Bank of England has? Well, I mean, so the bank will always just be watching the markets and looking at kind of the, the broader macro economy. If something... I mean, the fact that this intervention was successful we were talking about kind of virtuous or vicious cycles. The fact that this intervention that they did yesterday was uh, uh, successful in that it moved interest rates market, it moved the kind of government bond market, that means at least there is a little bit more confidence that the bank can actually kind of move things if it wanted to, which, you know, in a strange way means it might not have to. You know, it can actually, just because there's a bit more confidence in it, be reassured that markets are going to kind of function again, albeit, as Mark was saying, with the fact that they are pumping billions of pounds of cash in there on a daily basis and that it's only a kind of two-week operation, so no one's quite sure what happens at the end of that. Um, like I say, there's, there's no straightforward kind of button that you can press. I mean, in, this, in, in a sense, there's, there's, there's two issues here. It's not like the UK economy has just you know, become a worse place overnight. There's fundamentals in this, in this country, in this kind of level of dynamism in the companies that there are, um, that are, that are strong. And this is, you know, still a very healthy economy fundamentally. The issue is just that there is a crisis of confidence in some of the institutions that, that we used to rely on to provide the kind of confidence that people had. And that's, you know, whether it's the OBR, whether it's the Treasury, whether it's the Bank of England, it might be that we're learning what happens when you spend years, as this government and kind of previous governments have done, essentially castigating those institutions and saying we don't pay any attention to experts. The, the problem with that, though, you know, as, as, as a kind of diagnosis is, OK, maybe that is true. What do you do about it? You know, and, and the answer is you need to build back trust. But building back trust takes usually many years. 
And in the case of, you know, think back to something like Black Wednesday, the last kind of serious, really kind of domestic UK financial crisis. That, that was something that obviously damaged the Conservatives' reputation for economic credibility for quite a long time. But as well as that, it took quite a long time to rebuild both the fiscal position and the state of the economy. What's worrying to me about this one is, in some senses, you know, a lot of us look back at Black Wednesday and say that was one of the best things that ever happened to the UK economy. It was obviously a terrible financial crisis at the time, horribly high interest rates for many people, partly for that, but partly also for other reasons in the housing market. But then what happened is the UK was kind of liberated from this exchange rate peg and was able to have really quite a positive bounce back for much of the 90s, where they kind of rebuilt the public finances and led to this period in 1997 where New Labour came in. They had one of the best fiscal positions, so state of the government finances, that any incoming government has had in, in a long, long time. This time around, unfortunately, you can't call this a release. It's not like we've released from anything. We've released from these institutions that everyone quite liked and was reassured by, and now we're kind of left out in the, out in the cold, and it's a question of needing to put things back together again. And, and, and Mark, is that, that's reflected in the markets, isn't it? So do you get a sense now that there, there needs, trust needs to be rebuilt? between the markets, between the government, between the Treasury, uh, between the Bank of England even, or, or just between the markets and the government, really? No, very much so, Jane. I mean, that's that's a key uh, point that Ed was making about the, the need to rebuild trust, and that trust has to be felt by in investors um, in order uh, to be restored. At the moment, as I say, because the Treasury and the Bank of England are seen or are perceived uh, not to be working uh, in tandem, despite the Chancellor's protestations over the last few days that he's speaking to the governor of the Bank of England every day, uh, there is a, a sense that they are not working uh, hand in hand. And when that uh, in, uh, in the economic policy of the government, a, a number of very senior business leaders that I've spoken to and financiers over the last few days, uh, the majority of those people do think it's going to be very difficult for this chancellor, as new as he is in his job, uh, to survive this crisis, that uh, for, for market confidence to be restored, there will have to be uh, a change of personnel at the Treasury. Whether that's true or not, we've heard the Prime Minister say that that is not on the agenda. But These if, are not political people you're talking to, I imagine. Absolutely not. These are you know, some of the most senior business leaders in, in this country uh, and, and some of the most senior bankers, uh, people who have their finger on the pulse of what's going on in financial markets all the time not just here but globally and I have to say it's been surprising to me just how um, dominant that view has been. There will be those though who will who will perhaps look at this from a different point of view and I spoke to Daniel Gross who used to be at the IMF um, now the director of at the Centre for European Policy European Policy yesterday uh, and he said that he thought that what, what the Bank of England had done was give in and panicked, and, and he said that the Bank of England is now engaged on a slippery slope. And, you know, I wonder if, if there are some who will look at this and say, actually, what Liz Truss and what Kwasi Kwarteng are trying to do here is something totally different. And, and the, the people that are complaining and the people that are panicking are those who are trapped in perhaps an old mindset. We all need to be a little bit more open-minded about looking at it in a different way. <clears throat> I, can, I can see where they're coming from on that. I think you can make that uh, argument. I mean, if you think about what happened, the coalition government was elected in 2010. The markets then were very, very worried about the deficit and about the UK's ability to fund its borrowing. In came David Cameron, Nick Clegg, George Osborne, Danny Alexander, and embarked on this period of retrenchment, of trying to cut public spending where they could. I mean, public spending carried on rising, but it didn't carry on rising at the same rate. And all this, that sort of cheese pairing, cutting a billion pounds here, a billion pounds there, well, it didn't really deliver productivity improvements. It didn't really deliver GDP growth of the sort that one would have hoped to have seen. And so then you get to the pandemic, and all of a sudden, the government is flinging billions of pounds at keeping people in work with, through the furlough scheme and other business support ventures. Government borrowing goes up by billions and billions of pounds. And the markets don't budge. Interest rates didn't move. Guilt yields were, were barely changed. And that was partly because the Bank of England had restarted QE. But even so, so I can kind of understand why Liz Truss and Kwasi Kwarteng might have looked at this and thought, well, everything that's been tried before just has generated ne negligible growth. We need to get back to a trend rate of 2.5% of GDP. Let's give it a try. And what's really taken them aback, I think, is the fact that the markets have reacted in the way that they have done. And the longer-term story to this, Jane, 
there, there are these characters in the markets who we call the bond vigilantes. And these are bond market investors who hold the feet of governments to the fire. They keep government policy or they keep governments honest. And it emerged in the, in the mid-1990s um, when uh, Clinton was trying to bring down the US deficit. And his uh, advisor, James Carville at the time, said, well, uh, if I believed in reincarnation, I'd want to come back as a great baseball player or something like that. He said, I've now decided I want to come back as the bond markets because they can uh, frighten you into doing anything you want. Now, over the years, the bond vigilantes have tried it with Japan, didn't really get anywhere because, as I say, Japan's quite an odd uh, economy and an odd market. They tried it with the US. They tried it with the Eurozone. You know, you had the Eurozone debt crisis where you saw bond yields of Spanish... Greek, Italian government debt blowing out. In comes Mario Draghi, the president of the ECB, and just says, we will do whatever it takes to defend the euro. And he did. And they invested trillions of euros in quantitative easing. So Japan, too big to take on. Eurozone, too big to take on. The US, certainly big, too big to take on. The UK, as, a, as the next biggest sort of G7 economy, probably the bomb vigilantes might fancy trying to discipline the UK into a bit of fiscal prudence. And I think that we've had a... That's kind of what we've seen. It sounds really nefarious. <laughs> it sounds like this terrifying group of people who are <laughs> well, no, trying to the, control our economy. No, they're not, it's not. The markets are dispassionate. Bond market investors are dispassionate. They're unsentimental. They're looking at the, at, uh, when, chiefly at whether a bond, in, a bond issuer is good for the money, whether they can repay it. Same as the bank manager is when uh, you come in and ask for a loan. They're, they're assessing your credit worthiness. And if they decide that your credit worthiness is shot, well, they're going to sell your debt. And this is the thing, like in the, in the UK, there are, the kinds of things that bond, bond vigilantes get uh, upset about are massive current account deficits, massive fiscal deficits. Current account deficit basically means you're reliant on other people to provide money to kind of finance you. Um, fiscal deficits, governments borrowing loads of money. And put those two things together, that's the recipe that they are kind of looking out for. And the UK has been kind of OK for the past decades, even though it's had both of those, but suddenly you're OK until you're not. And that, that's the worry, is maybe we've gone over that edge. OK. Uh, a reminder at home, if you just tuned in, you're watching Financial Crisis Explained. We're joined by three of our top business experts about the crisis hitting the markets. We've got our city editor, Mark Kleinman, our business presenter, Ian King, and our economics and data editor, Ed Conway, still here to explain the finer details. Uh, we're now going to look uh, towards the future uh, and consider what might happen next. Uh, crystal ball time at the ready. Uh, um, also, uh, I should remind you that a little bit later, we're going to be uh, giving you an opportunity to put some of your questions to our experts. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a short while. Uh, but, but, Ed, just in terms of, of looking at the future, um, the government appears to be doubling down. Um, are we going to see more, more Bank of England interventions, do you think? We just have to wait and see. I mean, uh, like... Yesterday, would I have guessed that that was about to happen? I mean, Ian, you probably had a hunch about it, but I, you know, I had no idea that the bank were about to intervene in a way that we hadn't really kind of seen before. So, it's inherently the future is inherently unpredictable. Uh, in markets like this, you know, I've got memories of the last financial crisis, and it was just a case of some days seemed calm, and it was like, oh, maybe it's okay, maybe we can relax now. And then the next day was miserable. And then the next day after that was calm and the next day was miserable. We just have to hope that, that that's not the pattern we're going to see now. But it's just hard to see from the outside until there's some sort of, you know, intervention from the government. And when I say intervention, you know, it could be just kind of like talking more straightforwardly about what their plans are, acknowledging that there is an issue that needs to be addressed and it could be addressed either through clarification or whether it's a change of plan. Um, but it's just hard to see and without any kind of intervention that this doesn't just continue like this. But it is, uh, the key thing, Jane, here is that what are we talking about right now? We're, we're trapped in something that, I don't know, is it a kind of markets crisis, a financial crisis? It's probably, you know, if the Bank of England's intervening in markets, maybe that, that makes it a financial crisis. But there's a difference between things happening in markets and this transmission mechanism that means eventually households have to pay it. And right now, it feels like we're kind of in the eye of the storm of that markets moment. It's only, you know, in the coming months that it really starts to be real for many households. And to some extent, it's already happening because if you've, you're trying to get a mortgage right now, it's kind of mm. difficult. But that's the thing to watch. And the sooner this markets crisis gets dealt with, 
the less we have to worry about that other stuff further down the line. Yeah, and we've had some good examples of real-world impacts of this actually this morning. I mean, we've had a trading statement from Next, which is regarded as the best retail business in the UK on the UK stock market by none. They've actually guided the market that they're going to be making £20 million less profit this year, and that is because they have detected concerns in consumer sentiment. August was not as good a month as they uh, were expecting it to be, and they've also uh, said, by the way, um, while that uh, the inflation picture in terms of closed price inflation he said Simon Wolfson the chief executive who as I say is a, is a retail sage he's actually said today we're seeing lower prices at the factory but because we all of those prices are denominated in US dollars UK customers are not going to get the benefit from it that's just one example of the sort of real world consequences of this and Mark is it possible you know looking into your crystal ball for us to put a time frame uh, uh, to the point that we know we are sort of out of the woods of all of this uncertainty uh, I don't. I don't think there is at the moment. I mean, it's probably a better place to ask that question, uh, answer that question. But the the reality is, is that all we can do at the moment is take things day by day. The Bank of England intervened yesterday. Had the you know its intervention had the desired effect of of stabilising and calming uh, markets. But as we've talked about, that intervention is due to last just for a couple of weeks. The question comes at the end of that: Are the pension funds that effectively forced the bank? to intervene yesterday, are they in a sounder uh, financial position? Uh, talking to some people in that market uh, today, uh, actually they're very concerned because we're at the end of September now, at the end of the quarter, the third quarter of the year. Uh, many of them face uh, demands around this point to renegotiate or renew their foreign exchange hedges. Of course what's happened to sterling in recent uh, days uh, is going to put more pressure on them uh, in that respect. So they are very nervous still about what the future, the immediate future holds. And so trying to put a time frame on a uh, fast moving, volatile uh, situation like this that spans financial markets, um, I think is invidious.